you know, after many talks, people come and ask me, may I have a copy of your talk? At this talk, I'm already, already tempted to ask how many may I have a copy of the introduction. Because <laughs> <laughs> I better have to use it sometime. It's a very nice introduction. Oh, thank you. When I, <clears throat> when I gave the title of the talk to the organizers, I said there's discovering particles. I left out the word element. Oh, by the way, my one hour starts now, right? <laughs> so I left out the word element for two reasons. One is that I thought that a short, slick name would be more attractive. And the name will go at the same level of movie names like Educating Rita or Finding Nemo, things like that. <laughs> Elementary probably would spoil that. The other reason is I have some, um, how should I say, some apprehension about the word elementary. Although maybe it doesn't apply to this audience. I remember when I was a postdoc in Maryland, there was a graduate student, my friend, who was from uh, just a very remote village from India. And he was also there doing, uh, I mean he was there doing his PhD and also doing particle physics, elementary particle physics. And uh, during one summer he went back to his home. And of course, all the villagers came to meet him, to greet him. And they all asked very eagerly, so what are you doing in that distant land? And he just said, I'm studying elementary particles. They really got extremely disappointed. <laughs> After all these years in college, all these years in university, still elementary. <laughs> Why will you do something at last? <laughs> so, I knew that the that probably this apprehension doesn't apply to this audience, but I didn't want to take chances. <laughs> so okay, so let's start with that word, elementary. What does elementary mean? There are actually two ways in which the concept of elementarity is used in the context of matter. Number one, that the elementary objects mix in varying proportions to, to produce compound objects. <clears throat> For example, the primary colors, red, green and blue, they mix to produce a sensation of other colors. Or there are early theories of elementary constituents of matter which thought that fire, water, air and earth and maybe one more, one or two more were the fundamental constituents and everything is some mixture of this, these four things. The second concept of elementarity is that the elementary objects bind with one another to produce compound, compound objects. <clears throat> now, this second one is the modern viewpoint. It originated with the atomic theory of Democritus and others. Many people claim, I mean many people claim that somebody else has done it, I am not going into that debate. But it, it also had its origin roughly 2000 years ago. Now, <clears throat> let's come to the modern world. In the modern world, we talk about matter composed of atoms. And atoms were established through the study of chemistry in the 18th and 19th centuries. And they were thought to be indivisible. That is why the name atom, in Greek, tomos means body. So, a tomos means something which doesn't have a body, which doesn't have a structure. So, maybe the Bengali translation would be, literal translation would be Oshuridi. Uh, but uh, that, that's how the name came about. However, we now know that atoms are not indivisible. They are actually bound states of electrons which are negatively charged and a nucleus which is positively charged. Now, for example, the binding energy of the electron, they, they are bound together. So the binding energy of the electron in a hydrogen atom, we know is 13.6 electron volts. So, if you can put a hydrogen atom 
in a potential difference which is larger than 13.6 volts sorry this should not be ev volts you can free the electron from the atom and form a hydrogen ion that is you can strip the atom of the electron for other elements also this is true but the amount of energy needed will be different and also depending on the on the element you will get different number of electrons so how was the electron discovered okay you take a solution of let's say a salt solution you put two electrodes in it apply a voltage an emf and if the emf is high enough then the the voltage will strip the atoms of their electrons and the electrons will move towards the positive electrode one of them will be positive one will be negative so the electrons being negatively charged will move towards the positive electrode now of course i'm saying it in this language but this was not the language that people used to discover the electron because they did not know what is the nature of the particles which are moving towards the electrodes it was not known until the end of the 19th century there was a problem in knowing this that the particles which are coming towards the electrode are getting struck by the electrode so how do you study them and then joseph thomson had this brilliant idea make a hole in the electrode so the particles will come out through the hole and so he made a hole and measured the charge over mass ratio of the particles which are coming out by applying some electric and magnetic fields he found that the ratio was much larger than that of any ion so he concluded that this must be a particle with very small mass because its charge over mass so the mass must must be very small and this must be some particle which is uh, not known otherwise so this was the discovery of the electron since they carry electric charge they call them electrons but actually liquid was not used by them they used a vacuum this is i didn't say thomson took a solution i said you take a solution <laughs> now the discovery of the nucleus was a little after 1900 radioactivity was discovered around 1900 and the typical energies of alpha particles which are coming out in the in radioactive decay was found to be of the order of mev mega electron volt and to the 6 electron volt now rutherford and his associates bombarded atoms with alpha particles with these uh, alpha particles which have this mev kind of energies and by bombarding this they saw the nucleus in a very classic experiment which i need not describe to this audience they found that the size of the nucleus is of order 10 to the minus 13 cm so it's down by a factor of 10 to the 5 atom is roughly 10 to the minus 8 cm so it's down by a factor of 10 to the 5 compared to the atom now we can ask the question why did the need mev energies to discover the nucleus couldn't they have done it with just something some weaker probes the answer is no and we have to go through a little bit of theory at this point it's the uncertainty principle okay let's say you are trying to discover some very small object you are trying to see some very small object so you have to shine it with some wave right so if you if the object has a dimension length dimension let's say l then in order to see the object the wavelength of the wave of the shining wave must have to be smaller than the than l if it's not smaller you won't see the object because in order to see the object you have to distinguish the object from the surroundings right so but if the wave is if the wavelength is very small compared to the wavelength the object and the surroundings are roughly the same at the same point so it cannot distinguish so you have to take small wavelength that is why we cannot see atoms with visible light 
Now, the De Broglie relation between the wave and particle natures tell you that if you have a wave with the wavelength lambda, that means the corresponding particles have momentum which is uh, 2 pi h bar divided by lambda. So now, uh, you, you, you put it in this equation. So that means this p, the momentum, will have to be bigger than h bar over l. I'm not, I'm not serious about factors of 2 and pi, etc., etc. Those are not important. I mean, the, the, the basic dependence is the important thing. So the, the, the momentum has to be bigger. H bar over L. So the moral of this story is if you want to know about smaller and smaller structures, you have to use more and more energetic probes. And this is a very important lesson. And the lesson is so important that I will I will describe it again in a different way. Suppose I have some object which are bound states of some smaller objects, and the objects, uh, the bound objects have length of order of L. So I have a small object which has length L, let's say, and I'm trying to see whether it is composed of some smaller constituents. Now you see, because I am talking of an object of length L, that means whatever the constituents are, they are somehow confined within a distance of order of L. That means the position uncertainty of those constituents are less than of order L. And now Heisenberg's uncertainty relation tells me that position uncertainty times the momentum uncertainty has to be bigger than of order of h, h bar. So that means if delta x has to be less than L, then delta p has to be bigger than h bar over L. So the momentum uncertainty has to be bigger than h over L. Now if the momentum uncertainty is this much, the momentum has to be bigger than the uncertainty itself, otherwise it doesn't make any sense. Let me give you an example. This is a wallet. It contains some money. I assume it does. Okay. But I don't know how much. Okay. But suppose you ask me how much money is in there. I will tell you, okay, maybe 200, 300, plus or minus 100. So there is a, an amount I am specifying and an uncertainty I am specifying. I will never tell you that probably this wallet contains 300 rupees plus or minus 1 lakh. <laughs> this is not possible, right? So, this is the point I am trying to make. The momentum has to be larger than the uncertainty in the momentum. Now, if momentum is larger than this, then that means that the kinetic energy is also accordingly bigger. Now, the particles which are the constituents, they will possess not only the kinetic energy but also some potential energy. Because without the potential energy, they will not bind. Right? And the amount of potential energy, the magnitude, will be larger than the magnitude of the kinetic energy. Kinetic energy has to be positive. So the magnitude of potential energy has to be bigger than the kinetic energy. Bigger by how much? Now there is this important theorem that is one of the most neglected theorem in our curriculum. That's called the Virial theorem. The Virial theorem tells you, roughly speaking, that the two magnitudes cannot differ by huge factors. I mean, it is also not possible that you have a system where whose total energy is, let's say, one in some unit, but that is because its kinetic energy is uh, one million and potential energy is minus one million and one. That doesn't happen. The ratio has to be, I mean, the, the, the two magnitudes of the total energy and these individual things, they do not differ by very much. So the total energy is actually 
compared comparable to the kinetic energy. So if the kinetic energy has to be large, the total energy also has to be large. So we need to supply this, this total energy to make the constituents free. So this energy, as I said, is of the order of the kinetic energy and the kinetic energy increases as this L decreases. Right? So if you want to see smaller particle, you have to give more energy to split the constituents in a bound state. So this is the model. As I just said, one needs higher and higher energies. And that is the reason that the subject uh, of elementary particle physics is also sometimes called the subject of high energy physics because you have to have high energy to see smaller and smaller particles. So now the basic problem for elementary particle physics is how do you get high energy? So is it uh, twice as large when you want to see a size half for the so that again? If you want to see a particle of size half the half of some unit, that you need energy twice as large. Like is it also here? Yeah? This is order of magnitude. So maybe with half, I cannot guarantee that it will be you know twice as large. But if you want to see, see, let's go back to the atom and the nucleus. Okay. So the nucleus is 10 to the five times smaller than the atom, and you needed instead of 10 electron volts, you needed one MeV. That's 10 to the 5 times the energy. So that's that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Okay. Okay. So how do you get high energies? So one solution, easy solution, is just have some big batteries that will give you high energies. So some big sources of static electricity. And in fact, this was the first thing which was tried uh, uh, in the form of which are called Fokker Walton generator. Van de Graaff generator and so we need not go through the details of the generator probably I am not even competent to go into the details but the basic idea is the following that there is a region where there is a potential difference that is a V so you put a particle in which has an energy E if the charge of the particle is let us say Q then when the particle comes out after traversing this region of potential difference V it will come out with the energy which is E plus Q times V so this is the way you accelerate the particle. You give more energy to the particle. The problem is that you cannot go very, very far with this idea. If you start using very high voltages, then breakdowns will occur. And so it will be a very dangerous affair. So you have to do it some other way. Okay. One probably solution is that you don't create the high energy particles. You just use the high energy particles which are obtained for free. So these are the cosmic rays. In the beginning of 20th century, it was observed that various detectors for charged particles, for example, say gold leaf electroscope, give a small but non-vanishing signal even when it is not put near any known source of charge particles. So in fact, at first people thought that maybe there is something coming from radioactive elements uh, in, the, in the body of the earth. But actually the flux was seen to increase when you take your experiment in a balloon and go up. So the conclusion is that the signals were coming from processes taking place outside the earth. So these are cosmic rays. In various astronomical environments, processes involving very high energy spaces and produce particles. So these particles on heating our atmosphere produce secondary particles and these are the things that you see. <coughs> now this is an opportunity because you have a free supply of high energy particles, so you can use it. So now what you have to do is actually you have to just detect the cosmic rays. The direct cosmic rays or the secondary cosmic rays, the things which are created from the <coughs> original things. So various kinds of detectors were developed in the first half of the 20th century. 
There was a cloud chamber, which basically was a chamber of saturated vapor of water or alcohol, or maybe some other liquid. And the vapor actually super saturated because it cannot condense into liquid because there is nothing like a dust particle or anything that will provide a seed for condensation. Now, if a charged particle passes through it, then that acts as a seed. And then the vapor starts uh, condensing around the path of the particle, and then you can take a photograph and can see this path. Bubble chambers, roughly the same, except you use a superheated liquid. Scintillation counters are different. It produces light when hit by a particle. Photographic emulsions, these are just like photographic films which were used uh, by uh, for taking family photographs. Maybe some of the younger people have never seen these things, but people who are my age or near about who were all dealing with this until uh, uh, two decades ago. <coughs> so, in the photographic emulsions, the photographic plates actually darken when the particle impacts. So, that's how you, you see the particle. So this is one uh, picture of a, I think this is a cloud chamber, I forgot whether it's a cloud chamber or a bubble chamber. If somebody can help me, cloud help. Cloud it was a cloud chamber, okay. So <laughs> this is a very famous, uh, famous uh, picture. I will explain to you why. Let me go, go to the next slide, I'll come back to it. The achievements were that lots of new particles were discovered through these cosmic ray studies. For example, the positron. The positron is, an, an, is the antiparticle of the electron. That means it has the same mass but opposite charge. And this is this picture is actually the discovery of the positron. Uh, the reason I say it's very important is that this is the track. You can see that this is the track. But there was a problem that when you see a track like this. How do you know whether a particle is coming like this or a particle is coming like this? You don't know of that. So Anderson, who discovered positron, he had this beautiful idea. The best ideas are sometimes the simplest. Beautiful idea. He put a lead uh, sheet in the middle of the thing, in the middle of the cloud chamber. So if a particle comes, when it goes through the lead sheet, it loses some energy. So if it loses the energy, the, the path will be more bent in a magnetic field. So now you can see one part is, is more straight than this part. This tells you that this particle came actually from this direction. And it's important to know the direction because whether it, whether it deviates clockwise or anticlockwise, that will tell you whether it has a positive charge or a negative charge. So this is the way that Anderson found the positron. The muon was found in the mid 1940s. It is a particle which nobody expected. And there was this famous uh, quote from I.I. Rabi who said that who ordered that? Uh, muon is a particle whose properties are very similar to, uh, to the properties of the electron, except that it's much heavier. It's about 200 times heavier than the electron. Then there was the pion which was discovered just after the Second World War. Uh, and this was the particle conjectured by Ukawa in 1935 or 36 to explain strong interaction between neutrons and protons. Neutrons and protons have some interaction which bind them together in a nucleus. This is the strong interaction. And Ukawa uh, conjectured that this strong interaction is actually due to the exchange of some particles which he called pions, after the Greek uh, letter pi. So, so actually, the muons were discovered when people were looking for pions. So they first discovered the muon, and then they found the pion <coughs> after the Second World War. The kaon, these are particles which carry a new property called strangeness, which was not known in any of the particles known before, and so on and so forth. This is not a history of science, so you know, I, I, I don't know. 
Um, but there is a limitation in this kind of research. The limitation is you cannot control over energies and fluxes of the particles. You have to be happy with whatever is coming from the sky. Okay. So you cannot uh, set up a, an experiment uh, which you can control and, and where you can get results in a time period that you wish to wish to finish your experiment in and so on. So this was uh, this was fine, but this was not completely satisfactory. People wanted more. At this point, before we go to the next uh, uh, next level. Let us ask the following question. These pions and muons that I talked about, these are not constituents of the atom. So this cannot be called really subatomic particles. Okay. So why am I calling them elementary particles if I think that all matter is composed of atoms? And if these things are not in the atom, why are they elementary particles? Okay. Let us go back to this definition of elementary again. We can give two definitions of elementary. Number one, elementary particles are constituents of larger objects, larger conglomerates. Number two, elementary particles do not have any constituents. So these are two extremes. Elementary particles make other particles number one. Number two is elementary particles are not made by any other particles. Okay. Now, in the modern definition of elementary particles, or really you have to say in any reasonable definition of elementary particles, only the second property would be necessary. The first property is not necessary to you at all. Why? Because there can be many particles which will not be able to bind. Making larger objects will mean that they will have to bind. There can be particles which do not bind. They cannot bind for, there can be many reasons why they will not be able to bind. For example, if a particle is unstable, if it decays very shortly after it's created, it has no time to bind. This is the reason that butterflies don't have families. They will shorten it. Okay. The second thing is that maybe the particle cannot bind. They don't have the, the glue which binds. Photons. Photons do not interact enough that they will bind with somebody else. Then there are neutrinos, which are even more weakly interacting. Okay? So they don't bind. They don't have enough, enough uh, fabricol. Uh, so, so we will talk about elementary particles only in the sense that these are particles which do not have any constituents. Whether they are constituents of anything else, that is irrelevant for us. Now let's come back to this question that we left after the cosmic rays. How can we accelerate particles? Without depending on the cosmic rays, we will make our own accelerators. So can we build machines? where we can accelerate particles and study their behavior at high energies. Then, if we can do that, then we can accelerate as many as we want, or at least as many as we can, and study them. Now, the idea is basically, remember the, the battery thing that I talked about, is that give a big kick, okay? And as I said, big kicks have their problems, you might break your leg, okay? So, the technique is don't give big kicks. Give small kicks, but many, 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 many small kicks. Okay? So, this is the idea. And how can you do that? So, by doing this, uh, how far you can go up in this dictionary? The di in this dictionary, the, 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 the kilo is well known, even in the marketplace it is well known. Uh, mega we have already encountered, that is MEV. Giga, that's also now known because of computers and bytes. Uh, giga, GeV. Tera is TeV is 10 to the 12. And now also there are names which I cannot remember always 10 to the 15 and 10 to the 18. But anyway, we, we won't go, go that far. So maybe 10 to the 12 is good enough for our discussion today. So how far can we go? 
So the first such uh, um, first such uh, instrument which was built was the cyclotron. This was conceived in the 1930s by Lawrence. And the idea is this: that suppose you have this uh, drawing. Uh, I, I will explain what this drawing is. All my drawings need explanation, otherwise nobody understands what I drew. Okay. Uh, suppose you have a, a magnetic field perpendicular to this uh, to this plane of the picture, and there is a, a particle which is going around in in this path. How will it go in this path? Because uh, if the magnetic field is perpendicular to the uh, to the plane of the picture, then and if the particle will have a some velocity in this plane, then the particle will have circular motion, right? So it starts from here and goes in a circle, and then in between these two uh, D's, so to say, the, the two semicircles, uh, there is a little gap. So as it comes out through the gap, you sort of change the direction. Okay? So then it, it goes again and and it goes on and goes on. So the circular path has uh, the the radius of the path is determined by this uh, equation that the force acting on the on the on the particle, which is the charge times the velocity times the magnetic field, has to be uh, equal to the centripetal force, which is m v square again the velocity here divided by r. R is the radius of the path. So this means that this pi r over v, I mean, this, I'm just rearranging these things, pi r over v is like this. So, if you have a, an alternating field, electric field between the, these two objects, such that when it crosses, you give it an electric field so that it increases its velocity. Now, with this increased velocity now, it will have for the same magnetic field, and of course, you cannot change pi. You cannot change the mass of the particle or the charge of the particle, and your p is fixed in the experiment. So this right hand side is fixed. So if you increase the v, then that will increase the r. So this way, this particle will go around with increasing and increasing radius. And then finally, you can just take it out and then do your experiment with this uh, particle, which has accelerated by now after several turns in your cyclotron. There is another idea which actually was realized much later, that is called the linear accelerator. This is about the same, I mean the idea is the same, but uh, there is an important difference. The important difference is that in this case, there are these sort of concentric cylinders. And as you see, the alternate cylinders are connected to one end of some power source, and then again, the other alternate things are connected to the other end, right? So now, let's say the particle is going through like this, and just when it comes to the end of the first cylinder, your alternating source is such that it actually accelerates to the next one. And then it comes to the next one, and then by this time, the, the alternating source has reversed, so it, alternate, uh, so, so it accelerates to the next one. And so on. So it goes to successive cylinders and accelerates like that. So uh, <clears throat> the the frequency of this uh, alternating source will have to be adjusted such that the the field changes the sign exactly when the particle comes to the end of the cylinder, and then you'll be able to accelerate the particle. These are called linear accelerators. The third idea is the idea of synchrotron. This has a working principle which is opposite to that of the cyclotron. In cyclotron, as I said, that there is a constant magnetic field and the radius of the path keeps increasing. In a synchrotron, the radius of the path is constant and the magnetic field is suitably varied so that the, the particle can move through this constant so through this path of constant radius. What is the advantage of that? The advantage is that 
see, in the picture of the cyclotron, you see that there is a whole circular region where you have to keep the magnetic field. Here, you don't have to keep the magnetic field over the entire circular region. You have to only keep the field around the circumference of a circular region because the radius is constant. Okay? <coughs> so, <coughs> yeah. The meaning is that the magnetic field has to be kept at the, circumfer has at the circumference of the circle. Hmm? Uh, actually, maintaining a large, a constant magnetic field over the large region of the of the circle is very very difficult. I mean, you can imagine in the CERN uh, machine. That's a uh, diameter is 27 kilometer. Circumference is 27 kilometers. How much steel you will need? Yeah. So you have to. If you have to keep a magnetic field on this whole region, that would be a huge thing, probably impossible thing. So now we have to keep the magnetic field only along the circumference. Now, with these uh, advances in the technology, there were many discoveries. In the 1950s and 1960s, there were many particles which were found, and the the particles could be accelerated to several GeVs, 10 to the 9 electron volts. And the particles which are found, were many, many hadrons were found. Hadrons means uh, particles which have strong interactions. For example, proton, neutron, pion that I talked about, kaon, these are hadrons. Okay? Not all particles have strong interactions. For example, electron doesn't, photon doesn't. Okay? So many, many new hadrons were found. Antiparticles of some of the hadrons were also found. For example, antiproton was found in the 1950s. Then, in the 1960s, people observed something very interesting. They observed the substructure of the proton in a sort of Rutherford type experiment. I mean, remember Rutherford experiment of, of finding the nucleus, basically bombarding the nucleus with something. Here also, the protons were bombarded, and then uh, you can see the substructure of the protons. So now it was known that the protons are, uh, they have also constituents, and the constituents of the proton came to be known as quarks. These are, the quarks are not only constituents of protons, they are also constituents of neutrons. There are different kinds of quarks in different uh, numbers. They can make either the proton, or the, or the neutron or some other hadron. So all other hadrons can be thought of had made, made of quarks. And at first, at first in 1960s, people just uh, thought about three kinds of quarks, but the number of quarks soon increased to account for some data, as we will see some. Yes? You have mentioned that all that particle has discovered in um, uh, cyclotron or um, linear accelerator or synchrotron. But in all the three techniques, you need that the particle has to be charged. But the neutron is not charged. So, yeah, the, the particle which you are accelerating will have to be charged. The particle mm -hmm. you are discovering will not have to be charged. Okay, the particle, ac ac particle acceleration, you have absolutely need charged particles. But then the charge, when the charged particles collide, what they will create, that you don't know. Okay. So now, uh, you see that we, uh, this is just a few particles which we know about after the, let's say that at the end of 1960s. Maybe, we, yeah, 1960s, these are some of the particles that we knew. Remember, this is, this is some. This is not an exhaustive list. Of course, we knew about the electron and proton. They are stable particles. So far as we know, even now, they are stable. So their lifetime is infinite. The neutron uh, has a lifetime of the order of 10 to the 3 seconds. And it decays through weak interaction. Uh, the muon has a lifetime of 10 to the minus 6 seconds. It also decays through weak interaction. Charged ions and kaons they are a little heavier than the mu one, so their lifetime is shorter, 10 to the minus 8 seconds, but still weak interaction and hyperons, lambda, called lambda, weak interaction, they have a lifetime of 10 to the minus 10 seconds. 
Now compare it with something decaying through electromagnetic interaction. Let's say the neutral pions. There are three kinds of pions. One is neutral and the other two are charged, positive charge and negative charge. So the neutral pions decay through electromagnetic interaction. Their lifetime, you see, is 10 to the minus 17 seconds, although the mass is roughly the same as the charged pions. Okay? So this is the difference between weak interaction and electromagnetic interaction. And if something decays through strong interaction, then their lifetime will be even shorter. Let's say of the order of 10 to the minus 20 seconds. So this is end of 60, right? Yeah. Don't you want to add one more particle in the first row? <laughs> oh, they, they are not everything. Oh. Now you can ask the question, we are talking about 10 to the minus 20 seconds, 10 to the minus 17 seconds. How can you be to measure this kind of time? And how can you know about objects which lives which lives so short. If something lives for 10 to the minus 20 seconds, how can you know? How can you even know about it? Okay. Okay. There are several and, ways. And, and they may not even be the detector. They will not. They will not. Because in 10 to the minus 20 second, even the fastest object which moves with the speed of light will go 10 to the minus 10 centimeter. Right? You cannot put a detector 10 to the minus 10 centimeters away, less, uh, less than an atom. Okay. There are other methods. Say, I, I will give you an example. Suppose I consider the collision of protons with positive charged pions. I told you pions are three types positive charge, negative charge, and zero. So protons with positive charge pions. Okay. Now consider it in the center of mass frame, that is the total momentum of the two things are zero. Is zero. Okay? Now as the total energy increases, the cross section usually decreases. But after it decreases to some point, you will see it doesn't decrease, it suddenly shows a little hump. And this is this energy is around 1230 MeV. Now, this hump implies that a very short-lived particle has been produced in the process. So, you have a proton and the pion coming and colliding, creating a very short-lived particle, and then the short-lived particle decays again to a proton and a pion. So, finally, what you see is proton and a pion coming and proton and a pion going out. And you just measure their energy, and this is the hump you are seeing. And this hump tells you that this in, in intermediate particle was produced. Why there is a hump? Uh, I mean, why the hump implies an intermediate particle? Okay. First of all, if you think of uh, in quantum field theory, the proton and the pion must have to go through an intermediate state to the proton and the pion. If you don't want to think about quantum field theory, just think about ordinary um, just um, perturbation theory in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, the first order perturbation, this doesn't happen. Okay. In second order perturbation, you know that you have to sum over all intermediate states. Right? And so those intermediate states will come with a factor like this. So there will be a, a four momentum square minus the mass of this intermediate object square and then plus i times the mass again and the gamma which is the inverse lifetime. So this is in the amplitude. So in the cross section there will be square of it, the, the modular squared of it which looks like this. Now if you plot this thing with respect to k square which is like the square of this energy that I am talking about because in the center of mass frame there is no three momentum there is only the energy so this is the energy square so if you plot this this will look just like a hump and this hump superimposed on a falling curve will give you this this thing okay so a hump like this <coughs> tells you that there is an intermediate particle but it tells you more. Where is the center of the hump? The center of the hump is at k square equal to mi square. 
Okay, this is where it, this function becomes maximum. And what is the width of the hump? The width of the hump is determined by this, which has the gamma in it. And the gamma is the inverse lifetime. So in other words, if you have an object, oh sorry, if you have an object with larger gamma, that is smaller lifetime, larger gamma will mean larger spread. Okay. So by the spread of the hump, you will be able to find the lifetime of the particle and from the peak of the hump, you will be able to find the mass of the particle. There is another way and when I am saying another way, I am not saying that each way is, is available for each kind of particle. You have to use one or the other depending on the circumstances. Suppose you have some initial state particles which are creating uh, some A and B particles and some X which is very short lived. And this X is then decaying into some C and D. So you don't see the X because it's very short lived. So what you are saying here is that from the initial state particles you are creating A plus B plus C plus D, four particles. Okay. Now, uh, now what you do is that you actually measure the momentum of the C and D. Momentum and energy, that is. Okay. Then you sort of calculate it. What will be the energy if you go to a frame where the momentum of these two particles taken together will be zero? See, with some other frame, the momentum will be different, the energy will be different, and you can calculate in which frame will the total momentum be zero. And in that frame, if you find the energy of C and D, then that will be the mass of the X. Is well, I am not going through the details. Suppose these, these have different charges or different masses or something like that. Okay. If not, then you will have to be more uh, imaginative on this. Yeah. I mean, suppose A and C are the same particles, then problem becomes more difficult. I am just saying a simplest scenario. Okay. Now, there are some problems with synchrotrons. <coughs> the problem is that a particle moving in a circular path is always accelerating because the path is not, uh, not uh, straight line. So, problem number one is that some force has to be applied all the time to keep it in orbit. Now, this force increases with energy. Now, if this force is uh, supplied uh, by applying a magnetic field, then high magnetic fields are required. Remember this formula that I was talking about in, in the context of the cyclotron. The V over R is equal to QB over M. Okay. So, so if you are you know, increasing V, then you have to use larger and larger B. Problem number two is that the particle actually, because it's moving in an accelerated, uh, I mean, because it's accelerating all the time, it radiates and loses energy. This is called the synchrotron radiation. For a particle of mass m and energy e, the energy radiated per unit time is goes like e to the power 4 divided by m to the power 4 and r square. r is again the radius. So these are the problems. And how do you solve them? If you want to go to bigger energies, then you build machines with bigger R. See, if you use bigger R, then this ratio is reduced. So then you can do away with uh, smaller B. And if you use bigger R, then for going to the same energy, you will lose uh, less energy through radiation. So you have to go to bigger R. That is the reason why particle physicists are building bigger and bigger machines. Okay, And the LHC, as you know, is uh, 27 kilometers, so we'll come to that. Okay. Then there is the question that whether you use fixed orbit machines or colliders. <coughs> Let me explain. That. In the olden days, people were using fixed target machines. Olden days means 1950s, let's say. Uh, that means that you just accelerate one particle and the another particle is just sitting somewhere and you just accelerate this particle and let it hit the target. Okay? Target is fixed. This is the fixed target. 
But this is actually big waste of energy. Let me show you how. Suppose I am colliding two particles, A and B. Maybe the same particle may not be, and let's not get into that. A and B, and producing two particles, C and D. Now suppose the total mass of C and D is bigger than the mass of A and B. Okay, That means that this transition will not automatically happen. You have to give some minimum amount of energy to A and B so that this can happen. Right? And okay, for I am taking a simplified uh, picture that let's say this A is at rest, that is a fixed target, and I'm just for making the uh, formula simple, I'm just assuming that the mass of B is small. So then the kinetic energy that B will have in order that this thing can happen is mc square, I mean this is not Einstein's mc square, this is m sub c square. The mass of c square minus mass of a square divided by 2 times mass of a times c square. Now I will write it in a simpler form. Let's say that this mass of the c is some r times the mass of a. That means with the collision, I am trying to create a particle which is r times heavier. So r is large. 10, 20, 50, this kind of thing. Okay, so this E sub B then will be greater than half R square minus one times the mass energy of A. That means now you see that suppose you produce a particle which is 10 times heavier than A. So this R is 10. Then this ratio is 49.5. I mean this this factor is 49.5, R square minus 1 over 2, that's the 50, roughly, okay? So in order to produce a particle that is 10 times heavier, you will need 50 times more energy. Okay? That is what I call the waste of energy. This can be avoided if you can, uh, you can use a collider, which also used to be called storage rings, because now we have two beams. You don't have a fixed target. There are two beams which are both moving and they are moving opposite to each other so that the total momentum is zero. So if the total momentum is zero, then finally the, the whole energy can be converted into the final state energies. So and in fact if the two beams have opposite charge, then you can, you can use the same setup to accelerate both beams because you have to you have to make the two beams move in opposite directions, right? But if they are oppositely charged, the same magnetic field will move them in opposite directions. So finally, you have to just make them collide. So you can have, for example, electron-positron colliders or PP bar, proton-antiproton colliders. These things came up. And there are advantages and disadvantages of both kinds. For example, if it's electron-positron, then synchrotron radiation problem is much worse. Because you remember that in the synchrotron radiation, there was a M sitting downstairs, M to the power 4, in fact, sitting downstairs. Okay. So synchrotron problem is much worse if you have electron positron. And of course, if you have PP bar, then it's better. And the reason is the electron mass is much smaller than the proton mass. If you want to reach very high energy, then with E plus E minus, it's more difficult. It's much easier with that with the PP bar collider. Why? Because PP bar collider, the proton already has roughly 2000 times more energy than the electron, just because of the mass. Okay. So if you want to go to let's say 10 GeV, that means for the proton you have to go roughly 10 times its mass, for the electron you have to go to 20,000 times its mass. Okay. So it's much easier to do that with proton. So if you want to reach high energies, you use the PP bar. But the problem is that the protons have substructure. As I told you, the protons are made up of quarks. So when two protons collide, it's actually the quarks between them which collide. And you don't know what is the momentum of the individual quarks in them. So you have to use some approximation or some theoretical uh, models to, to, to calculate what will be the result of the, uh, of the collision. Because of this, you cannot do a precision test. You cannot measure something, you know, one part in thousand accuracy through a PP bar collider, but you can do it through an electron-positron collider. So there are these two types of 
things which always go hand in hand. If you want to go to high energy, you use PP bar collider. But then if you want to make precision test, then you use the E plus E minus collider. And that's how we go to higher and higher energies and make more and more precision test. This is a typical picture of a process. I mean, maybe not typical, this is one picture of one process. Okay, so this is the place where the collision has happened and things have been produced and they are going in all sorts of directions. So we have gone to bigger and bigger colliders. Let's say the super proton collider, SPS at CERN. Uh, this has a 6.9 kilometer circumference and the energy was like 300 GeV. PP bar. This is a PP bar collider. And other than PP bar collider, you discover the W and the Z. In the Tevatron, uh, which is at Fermilab, um, the, the length was about the same. You can go to higher energies, and uh, the, the, the top quark was produced. It's another kind of quark. And uh, Nobuda was part of this collaboration sitting here. So then people made the electron positron collider because we have to make precision tests. And that was built at CERN and that is, has a length of 27 kilometers and could go up to 45 GeV each beam so that people could produce uh, and much higher. Much higher. Much higher. Yeah. It's only for Z. It went much higher. Oh, it went much higher. Yes, yes, yes. It went up, up, ultimately it went up to 150 or something, right? Yeah. yeah. It started with 45 and then they made, yeah, yeah. funny. Yeah. So then they uh, made precision tests on the, the Z boson and so on. And now we are going to the Large Hadronic Collider, which uh, again is the, is the same tunnel that we are using, but it goes to 7 GeV and actually more. I think this <coughs> 7 is outdated already. Uh, now it's what, 13? 14. 13. 13. 13. 13. Yeah. Now it's uh, 13,000 GeV or 13 TeV. This is also a proton collider. No, and you say the no. energy of part B. You are talking about, so see, when you say 45, you are talking about part B. <coughs> yeah. Then, uh, then 7,000 is. Like, it will go to 7 ultimately. Okay, okay, okay. Yes, yes, sorry, yes. Whether it's part B or two beams added. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, we have already seen the Higgs boson being discovered at the LHC. We don't know what else will be discovered. We hope there will be something else. This is a modern detector which uh, I feel hesitant at describing it because there are people who work in this detector who are sitting in this audience. But uh, uh, as you see, this is a kind of, this line is the line from which the beams come and this middle is where the collision takes place and when the particles go out they go through these concentric cylinders where at different uh, levels different things are detected. Okay? That's how the experiments are done. And if you want to know how big the detector is, I'll tell you that this is one person. Uh, I don't know if you can see the person sit, uh, the standing here, this is one person. Okay. You know how much a person is. So, the present list of elementary particles. What we have got? First of all, there are the fermions. And in the fermions, there are two big classes. The leptons <coughs> and the quarks. The leptons do not have any strong interaction. The quarks do. So in the quarks, I have already uh, talked about the, the fact that proton and neutron, etc., are composed of quarks. Actually, protons and neutrons are composed of these two quarks only, up and down. They have electric charge, two third and minus one third in the units of proton charge. And then there are four other quarks. This strange quark I talked about, which is the kaons have strange quark, but there is charm, uh, bottom, and top also. In so, so this uh, charm, string, top, bottom, they are not in the atom. Correct. They are short-lived. 
They are too short to get through. That's not really correct, I would say. Hmm? They, they are not in that room. They are maybe they are in the virtual state. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, it is there. Okay. No, not in to, to, to many people, those two statements are the same. But <laughs> Okay, and then uh, the leptons. Leptons, there is the electron, and I already talked about the muon, which is like the electron. There is a third one called tau, which is again like the electron and the muon, except heavier. All three have ma uh, charge minus one, and then each of them have a neutrino uh, corresponding to them, which are uncharged. So these are the uh, fermions in the ele elementary particle spectrum. There are bosons, which are the photon, but then there are the W and the Z bosons, which uh, like the photon which mediate the electromagnetic interactions, the W and the Z bosons mediate weak interactions, and then there are gluons, eight of them, which mediate strong interactions. And we have already uh, talked about the Higgs bosons. We have mentioned the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson is different from these. These particles have spin 1. The Higgs boson is the only particle which has spin 0 according to the standard model of particle interactions. So we have found it. And so far, we haven't found any other particle, elementary particle, which has spin 0. Apart from the, uh, these experiments, there are also non accelerated experiments which I should just mention briefly uh, before I finish. And uh, many properties of elementary particles can be tested without accelerators. For example, testing proton stability, whether the proton stable or it decays. And these are done in huge underground experiments, um, yeah. but no instability has been detected so far. There was a solar neutrino detection, which uh, also detects neutrinos from the sun, which detects neutrinos from the sun. And actually, this was a very much a success story, because the results, from the results, we have known a lot about the properties of neutrinos in the last uh, one or two decades. Then there are neutrino observatories, which are detecting cosmic neutrinos, because we have already detected the solar neutrinos. There was the idea that we can probably detect more neutrinos from coming from other things. <coughs> so there were these uh, observatories which are made. Usually observatories means that you detect light or some electromagnetic radiation, but these observatories detect neutrinos. And these experiments have just begun. The experiments have been set up and taking data and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Then there are also um, experiments which are, can be done for dark matter searches. The labs are being set up all over the world. And again, uh, you know that uh, I'm not the best person to talk about it. There are people who will be going two days from now to set up one of the labs in uh, Yes. <laughs> yes, I, I know the name. I was, I was just being distracted by some gestures of Munshi. He was trying to show some, something. Anyway. Anyways, people are going to set up this lab, but there are other labs in other parts of the world which are also being set up. So this, I have, as you see, uh, the good news is that I have finished. <laughs> and also you see, the, I finished the time. So this is the end of the talk.